started your so we're starting. Um, so my name is Deanne Corcoran. I work on the network business enablement team at Alcatel Lucent Enterprise and welcome to our webinar on micro segmentation. For anybody on the line, whether you're a customer, um, current customer, prospective customer, business partner, uh, internal employees, I know like to get on these as well. We really appreciate you being here. Um, questions and feedback, of course, are invaluable to us, so please um, offer them away. A couple housekeeping items. Of course, the call today is being recorded. If you have any objections, you can disconnect now. All lines are muted during the presentation. After the presentation, we love to take questions from the attendees. You may post a written question at any time during the presentation um, in the control panel, and it's a, a wise thing to do. If you see something on a slide that you want to ask about, um, please ask away, and we'll go back at the end and answer everything that's asked. Um, there's no time limit on that. So, And uh, after today's call, you'll get an email from GoToWebinar that will have a recording of the um, webinar embedded within it. And then if you missed getting the PowerPoint or the PDF, please just reply to the email. They all come to me, and I'm happy to send them to you. Unfortunately, we can't do them as an attachment out of GoToWebinar. So again, the topic for today's call is uh, micro-segmentation in the wireless LAN. This is the final of a series of webinars we've done, of uh, technical webinars we've done on wireless LAN. Um, Jorge Arasanz is our, pre our pre uh, presenter, and he is a network architecture solution engineer, architect. solution architecture yeah, yeah. No at problem. Alcatel Lucent Enterprise. So Jorge, go ahead. Thank you so much, Diane. As always, I am delighted being hosted by you. Thank you very much for your for your introduction. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on your location around the globe. Uh, welcome to this series. Uh, we, that we, this is, I think, the third chapter or episode of this series. And we will today cover the micro segmentation in WLAN networks. So let's start. Uh, this is the agenda for today's uh, for today's webinar, and we will be covering the several topics uh, for a little bit um, around 45 minutes, probably a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on on the questions and so on. And this is the agenda. Uh, let's talk about micro segmentation. This is a, a concept that we are exploring or are overloading. Uh, is coming from the from the cloud service provider from the virtualization world. Uh, and we are bringing down this micro segmentation concept to to the network side, and see if we can have some benefit of exploring this concept of micro segmentation to, to the network. We will see which is micro segmentation, why we are talking about segmentation, micro segmentation. Then we will see how Academic Enterprise is uh, dealing with the micro segmentation, how we are implementing this micro segmentation in our products, basically in our stellar product range and the omni switch product range. We will be uh, today focused on stellar part, but all, I would say, 99% of what we are going to do today with, regarding stellar is uh, almost the same in. In AOS, in the Yakatalusian operating system, which is uh, powering up our our Omni Switch uh, brand family. Then we will see which is the Stellar AAP, which is at the end this is the Stellar series, and we will cover uh, Stellar presence. Uh, sorry, the AAP presence as, as the Stellar AP may have different uh, inputs from different sources uh, for the AAP. Which one has take presence over the others? This is important to understand. And then we will dedicate some minutes to how to keep the coherence across the whole network between the access network in WLAN and the access network in in, in uh, switch network in, in M switch, and how to be co coherent across our autonomous network in, in the in the Acatalus Enterprise solutions. And last but not least. In this case, uh, we will be uh, having some small lab how to configure these ARPs, how to configure the UPAN for delivering the, uh, the ARP, which is the we will show the ARP precedence, what happens when there is a mismatch in the ARP naming, these kind of things. And we will hopefully, hopefully, we will have some time 
to see the auto, auto integration between the APs and the on switches. So let's start with the security. Uh, this uh, set of uh, episodes or, or, or uh, webinars have been related with security. This is Stellar, WLAN, and security. Uh, it is the opportunity to talk about security, but we will uh, talk in about many other related topics as well. So in this uh, series, we're talking about security. As I always say, security is a process. It's not a product, it's not a feature. Security has to be with uh, uh, how to behave, how to follow a, a procedure, and then obviously technology is here to help us to follow these procedures and protocols and as uh, so we say if you have the latest uh, layer 7 application firewall but you don't apply the right rules and you don't follow the right procedures you are doing nothing because at the end as i said product is a combination of many of many many things when we talk about, about security obviously our part in the security world is the telecommunication part that is mainly covered by some security services that we, we, we used to call this authentication, confidentiality, integrity, non-repudiation. For me, time stamping is a security service in this, in this space as well, because it will help any of the others. And access control, for sure. In the first webinar that we will that we cover, we will go deep into how to do uh, the hardest access control solution, which is EAP TLS, dealing with certificates and radios, the UPAN and so on. That was the, the first web, uh, the first uh, webinar covering authentication and access control. Then we had a second webinar two months ago, more or less, uh, or one, one month and a half ago. And this second webinar was related to WPA, basically WPA and security in the water sand space in terms of encryption, confidentiality, and so on. That was related with these security services, which are confidentiality and integrity of the information that we exchange. And now we are talking about segmentation and micro segmentation. What is this? Okay, segmentation and containers is something, is a new technique that is coming from the virtualized environments where we try to reduce the number of uh, elements that, act, that can exchange information between each other in order to avoid many different problems that may arise when you have a very large architecture. So if you reduce the number, you try to um, make a smaller segments of your whatever you're doing, in this case uh, a virtualized environment, in our case a network environment, uh, and you co finally control what the elements can do with other elements, so the relationships between the other elements that you have to handle, then you can obtain important benefits, especially in the security way. Because if you, con you find grain control what an element can do with other elements, you are placing, your, your, you're saving your time, you're saving your life, and you will probably uh, at the end controlling um, the resources, uh, how to access the resources of these devices that are accessing your, your network. Um, the micro-segmentation then is a technique that will allow us to fragment our networks more than we are usually doing. So today we are usually doing VLANs, for instance, if we are in the, in the legacy world. In, in, a, in a VLAN you can exchange information, all the members of a VLAN can exchange information. But if you remember, if you are aware of that, we have a concept of private VLANs. In private VLANs, we excuse it a little bit, the, the term, the, the concept of, of a VLAN, and we try to, to, to reduce the, the communications that some elements in the, VLAN, in the same VLAN can do with other elements in the same VLAN. And here with the segmentation, we are doing, uh, uh, we are going a little bit further, and then we are going to assign a profile, we are going to let's say, do um, a trailer suite to every device or every user and device or every application that we have in our, in our solution, in our network. Uh, so this, this uh, tailor-made suite will be only allow this element to do whatever we want to do, uh, is needed to do. So he has to send information with, with other element. We can control, we can find grain control what kind of information can be exchanged. So somehow we are reducing 
the space. We are reducing the impact of this element. That's what we call micro segmentation. And obviously, it's related with security, as uh, basically we are related with uh, it is related with access control. Uh, access control and what once you are in the network access control, what you are allowed to do in the network. That uh, that the whole uh, the whole uh, significance of the access control. Okay. Okay, so we have been doing micro segmentation, segmentation sorry, for years in our space, in the network space. We, are, we started to have a firewall, for instance, and then we started to create micro firewalls in this firewall. We call them virtual firewalls, for instance, where we can create partitions of this large firewall and start to create smaller ones. So we, are, we can better control or find control what is happening in this very small uh, uh, virtual firewall and what is the relation of this virtual firewall with other virtual firewalls and so on. The same concept applies in the, the routing schemes with, uh, for instance, EMPLS network. We have BRF, BPRS, we have BPLS, BLS. All of them are segmentations of the of the same network, like we do in in an omni switches with uh, BRF, or like we do in in the transport network. For instance, in in regular networks, we use VLANs to segment. The, the network uh, in in the SPV area we use ICs, which is uh, this SPV containers, these uh, that are more more secure, more robust than a regular VLAN in terms of isolation, and then we can do the same with, for instance, with BXLAN with the BNI, with the BNI at the end, the BNI is like a container that you have all the information inside this this part. But we want to go a little bit. Further, we want to explore new new horizons, and then we, once we we reach this this world of micro segmentation. This is an example where we have a power utility, for instance, where we have the the SCADA that is living there here, and we have all the elements in our substations, for instance, connected to this uh, SCADA container that could be a VLAN or could be a, in this case is a SPV container, but could be a VLAN. It's the same you now because it's an abstraction. Uh, yeah, about the, the container, and all of them can exchange information theoretically. But do we really want that? No, no, we, we don't want that. Especially we're talking about secure grid, especially in the, in the power utilities world. So what they want is that some elements may be allowed to exchange information or to, or could, or to gather information from other elements, but other elements may be completely isolated and only have access to the centralized SCADA server that will receive all the information. In this case, for instance, let's suppose that some SCADA actuators that has to take care of the power concession of a line and can and can operate the breakers of the line in order to avoid that uh, a chain may tear down the whole grid uh, for a peak of consumption or a peak of current. So this SCADA actuator is, is continually measuring the, the readers, the SCADA readers, but the SCADA readers should not be allowed to go to the actuators. Why do you want an SCADA reader to go to the actuator? It has no sense at all. And just imagine if you are working in the security space, what happens is someone gets access to the reader and from the reader can jump into the actuator. You can probably be in a risky situation. So you want not to, to, to only allow to exchange information in this in your regular container that you have been using for years in, the, in your VLAN or your SPV area, but you want to provide a more granular control. You want to really fine tune what elements and what things or what information and what element can be exchanged between them, okay? So this is the, 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 the aim of micro segmentation in the network space. That could be, is, uh, the concept could be more or less the same that we are working in the, in the, in the cloud or the virtualization world, but here we are applying it in a, in a, in a different context. Obviously, this is uh, something we can do at, at, at any layer, and we will take uh, care of, the, of it, uh, how we do it uh, in, some, in, some, in some minutes. So how do we, in Akatolus in Enterprise, implement this micro segmentation? Okay, we use a concept of role, of the role, of, uh, in general, I'm talking, we use, we use the term access, Role profile ARP. Okay, uh, is, if some of you guys are network engineers 
And if I mention A and B, you will be automatically thinking about broadcast, uh, IP, IP before resolution, uh, resolutions, and so on. This is not that IRP. This is another thing. IRP is the acronym coming from standing for Access Raw Profile. Okay, and along our literature, you we, you may find two concepts that are exactly the same concept, which is ARP and User Network Profile. It is exactly the same. Okay, it is it's just that from the marketing perspective, sometimes we prefer to use Access Raw Profile or we prefer to use User Network Profile. In User Network Profile, we dedicate it to the data center space or to the uh, transport networks, these kind of things, or service provider networks. But for uh, the, the campus networks and enterprise networks, we prefer to use the term access row profile as one we, uh, we will be using here today. So access row profile, is, is, this is the way we do micro segmentation. How do we uh, micro segmentation? Okay, we create this container, this, um, let's say, this piece of information that we contain everything we need to create the microsegment. Starting for, for the VLAN or the service stack, depending on if we are talking about VLANs, we are talking about SPV, we are talking about any other technology in the, in the communication. Then we have the QoS policies. Uh, if, uh, with, with, if you want to do some traffic shaping for Facebook or Twitter, for instance, I want to do, I will not block probably, uh, completely Facebook, but will reduce the Facebook uh, consumption to one megabit per second, for instance, and will allow the the Salesforce or the FTP or whatever application that you may need for your business, for the your real business, uh, will allow 20 megabit per second or 100 megabit per second, whatever, whatever uh, traffic. Uh, th then we have the firewall rules or ACLs, depending on the platforms. If we are talking about uh, stellar APs, which is our case, we're talking about firewall rules, because now from release 401, we have uh, dynamic and reflective uh, ACLs. That is exactly what the firewall is using. So we create dynamic rules, and this is, can be considered a firewall rule. And if we're talking about omni switches, especially in the low end omni switch range, we are talking about ACLs that are very powerful, but are, are not reflexive, and so we cannot talk about a firewall. Then we have the layer seven application rules that will allow us to control, even for instance, doing uh, HTTPS. We, we, we know that uh, all, all traffic is carried today on HTTPS, but we have uh, layer seven signatures of the applications. So even doing HTTPS, we know that this guy is doing Facebook or is doing Twitter or is doing Salesforce or is doing whatever he's doing or Office 365. So we can then uh, block Facebook and allow Office 365, or if the guy is in the marketing team, we allow Facebook and block, I don't know, FTP, this kind of thing, okay? So this is the latest application rules that can be, can be in the ARP profile as well. And then we have location in terms of where is this guy or where is this lady connected from? Uh, could be from the labs, or could be from the main office, could be from the branch office, could be from this AP, which is near the the the, the, the bar or whatever. So we, we know the location and time of day. So weekends, only working hours, only full access uh, all the week, whatever, whatever you want. So the ARP, as I said, contains all the information for this micro segmentation, and then we have it could be dynamically and automatically provision it in a network, meaning that you don't have to be uh, taking care of it. It will be according to our AOS and IWOS, which are the operating systems in the Stellar and the Omni switches, you will be uh, allowed to configure one time and then they will be dynamically be applied, either by classification, either by 1x authentication, or by default uh, profiles, manually assigned it because you want to fix uh, a profile to some specific uh, device. Uh, you, you, can, you can do reduce change of authorization. For instance, when you are in a guest network in an airport, you receive uh, full access for half an hour. And once uh, the, your half an hour expires, uh, the reduce will send you another profile, another, another access row profile that will 
reduce the bandwidth that you are using in your in the, in the network unless you go and pay for, for the internet access. And the most important thing here is that the ARP will, uh, and, the, and this dynamic framework will allow us, as you know, we are in a, a stellar uh, solution, is a, um, is a controllerless solution. We don't need a controller to send traffic to it and then, and then go back and then go out. So there is no need for a controller. Uh, meaning that uh, the, the AP has to take care of everything. We really know today that the system on a chip that we have in our APs and the CPU we, we combine with these SOCs are incredibly powerful. We can do layer seven application recognition, we can do firewalls, we can do many things in the APs. So it has no reason at all to send traffic to a centralized point. Nevertheless, if you really want to do centralized inspection, we can do it. We can do tunneling to our omni switches for doing specific works in the omni switches tra tunneling traffic into there or we can even tunnel the traffic to uh, an oem slash aruba controller with, which is our oem as you already know and we can send traffic to the aruba controller and then apply in the aruba controller whatever we want to do so but as we as generally talking we are not in a in a controller based solution we are it's a controller less we have to do something in our network to be aware of this profile that we are we are placing in the AP, because once we place this profile in the AP, it, it that profile must be coexist, must be coherent across the whole network. So no point in the middle will allow the the traffic to go out or to, or to escape. And so this is something we do automatically between the Eastern APs and the Omni switches. It's something we will cover a little bit later. So uh, starting with the as a, a ARPs, with the access row profiles, what is that, uh, how do we create the SRO profile? Well, is the, for instance, this is the, the, the very basic case where we create the configuration for an ISIS, uh, SSID, for the wireless down SSID, we are forced to create an access row profile. And this access row profile will be linked, hard linked, with the communication part, uh, with which VLAN are we going to use? With with tagging in the VLAN side, are we going to use? With ACL uh, rules, which QoS rules, which which applications are we going to allow the user to use or not? Uh, which time of the day? These kind of things. So every time we create an SSID, we are forced to create an access row profile, and this access row profile is called the default access row profile, and it's a hard link between the SSID and the access row profile. So when we first create the SSID, we have to create the access row profile. Then later on, we can break this hard link and do whatever we want. But at the very beginning, the first time we create the SSID, we need to create the default access row profile. So visually talking, and probably is more easy to understand, when we create an SSID in the Estera, this is the AP, when we create the SSID, we create the so-called default ARP, and this is hard linked to an IRP. And this ARP is containing all the information to do this micro segmentation. Obviously, we can once we have this one, then we can create as much as we want. We can we can full, uh, fully mm, fill the the fulfill the the, the the AP with ARPs. So we, you can you can populate and can create as much APs, uh, ARPs as, as, as you may need or as you want even. And um, some of them may have the same VLAN, for instance, this guy here, this guy here, this guy here at the same VLAN, but may have different network characteristics, maybe different network parameters. So the behavior of a device connected to the default or silver or bronze will be completely different in the network. Default may allow a very, very reduced set of communication of this device with the with the other with the with the other network with the part of the network. Silver may be allow you to go uh, to the data center for some servers or some services, and bronze maybe is only allowing you to go to the internet. Maybe that's an example. But you may have a dif different external profiles even not only in the same VLAN, but even moving the the, the user to different VLANs, and this is dynamic. You can change the access row profile as many times as you want. And you can do it um, dynamically, automatically, especially using reduced, reduced change of authorization. Okay, this is the most, 
the most uh, intelligent way of doing that uh, using a change of authorization that is activated by a condition. Condition could be, as I told you, in the airport example, a bandwidth consumption or time consumption or whatever any other uh, information that you may trigger and then react and send uh, a change of authorization with a name of the as a row profile to, to apply. So generally talking, when we created this, this SSID with the default uh, as a row profile, which is VLAN 100, and this guy connect, we don't care about the authentication, the authentication could be pre-share key, could be open, could be 1x, could be country portal, could be whatever. This guy connects and the connection is successful and the authentication, if it is an authentication is successful, okay, everything is, is okay, it's perfect, then we apply the default role. And the default role says, okay, this guy has to go out with VLAN 100 and apply this set of policies, this set of parameters to this connection. Okay, I apply all of these and the traffic goes out using a tag 100 corresponding to the VLAN 100. Okay, perfect. Everything is working, but somehow this uh, guy uh, needs to go to other servers or have, need, needs a more, more uh, privileges. So there is a Redis authentication, probably, or maybe a change of authorization. We don't know. It, it doesn't matter in this case, but we receive an, a name, a, a new access row profile. The AP receive another access row profile. I say, okay, I have to apply now to this guy that used to have the default access row profile. I have to apply this one, which is silver. Okay, no problem at all. Shift to silver and dynamically will shift to silver. And then this guy will be automatically placed in the silver ARP and will go out using again the same billion tag because it's 100, but with a complete different set of parameters, different QoS, different ACS, different firewall rules, different everything. So probably they will, well, probably absolutely the behavior of this device in the network will be completely different. We can even change the, the, the villain and force a, a port bones, which is called uh, so-called port bones. So the device detects that has been disconnected and connected, so reclaims a new IP address and will, be, uh, will receive a new IP address if needed. Okay, we have, uh, now we, we know, which is micro segmentation, we know that in Lecker Toulouse Enterprise we use the ARP, we use ARP for uh, doing the micro segmentation. And I told you, in our framework is very extensible, is very flexible and very open. So this access row profile that is populated in the, in the AP someone has to say to this AP which access row profile to apply. So which, uh, what, what is the, the precedence? Which one takes relevance over the other ARPs? Because I can receive the, I can use the default ARP. I can use the ARP that is coming from the radio server. I can use the access row profile that is coming from an external radio server. I can use an XRO profile that is coming from my radius and then an active directory that is outside of my network that is bringing the, the somehow the XRO profile. So which one is going to be to be applied? Which, which which is the best one to apply? So there is some rules I will I will show you that takes over the others. It's, it's a precedence uh, in the XRO profiles. So as I told you, we have the default ARP. The default ARP is Basically, with very simple networks, we, when, when, the, when, when you're using open authentication, uh, whatever it means open in authentication, uh, hopefully doing uh, captive portal and opportunistic wireless encryption using WPA3 1 uh, 11 AX APs, the new APs we'll be using, uh, all, all, uh, and the 1200 families as well will be using OVE, opportunistic wireless encryption. Uh, and this is uh, better than nothing. Uh, you may have pre-shared key or in Mac, in Mac authentication, you will get the default ARP. If you go to more complex scenarios, you are then going to use either our uh, identity management solution, which is UBAM, uh, Unified Policy Access, uh, Access Manager, 
that will is, is a reduce, or you can use an external reduce as well. Here, if you are using our UPAN, you will uh, get the ARP, probably you will get the ARP using the authentication strategy we will cover it a little bit later. And if we are using a UPAN and an external source of authentication, could be a, a reduce, external reduce server, could be a, an external Active Directory or external LDAP, or could be the internal database in the UPAN, which is considered in this case, even though the name is internal database, really is external to the UPAN. So it, can, it can brings information about ARP to the, to, the, to the UPAN. So we have different sources from ARPs. So which one applies? Which is the, 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 the real one that is going to be um, taken in the process of assigning the ARP to the, to the user? Okay, before going to that, let's remember how UPAN works. Remember UPAN, this is, uh, I think this coming from the first webinar that we held, we were talking a little bit about the UPAN. UPAN was in this way. We have something what we call access policies in UPAN. Remember that access policies and these access policies are basic or complex depending on the, the time and your, and your needs and that will try to match parameters that are coming in the reduce request coming from the AP. The, this reduce request that is coming from the AP that has been, let's say, triggered by the 1x exchange here, the AAP exchange here, this reduce will bring some, some information. Information about the AP, information about the customer, the MAC, of the, the MAC address of the customer, the, the login of the customer, and, and a lot of information. So we can create access policies here. For instance, if the SSID is whatever, or if the user starts with uh, A or with B, whatever we want to do. So these access policies uh, will be populated in the UPAM and a new request will enter into the UPAM. So we will try to find which is the right access policy that matches. And once it matches, it is linked with an authentication strategy. The authentication strategy is the one that will tell the UPAM what to do with this request. If, if we have to go to search for the user in the internal database, could be this one, the, the top example here, or could be go to an external radio server to search for the identity of this user, and this radio server will, will respond, or we can go to an external LDAP or Active Directory or whatever. Then we have the response coming from the outside world, that will go to the authentication strategy, but for what we, what we call the return policies. So once we get the return policies, we can modify this return policy and try to derivate a role. For instance, if this return policy is coming not from the radio server, but from the active directory server, we may want to match a specific field of the active directory response to match and to extract the access role profile from that one. So we can derive, we can derivate the role from, from, the answer, from, the, from this uh, answer, from this external uh, answer. And then we, we will then send the final ARP to the, to the AP that is going to be applied or not, depending on the other parameters we'll see later on the, on the AP. So this is the precedence. The top highest precedence is the access row profile that is coming from external sources or the internal database in the UBAN. If we have access row profile here, that access row profile is the one that is going to be applied. Okay. If we do not receive any information from the external radius or the external active directory or from the internal database about the ARP, there's no information at all. It's only a accept, for instance, because the is a, a valid user but I don't have information about the access row profile to apply. Then it will take precedence, the authentication strategy, access row profile, okay? The, the, the UPAN access row profile, we will see later. And latest, at least, the, the lowest one is the default ARP. So if there is no information coming from the external source, and there is no information about the ARP in the UPAN, then I will apply the one that is in the default uh, ARP, 
that we created when we populated the, the SSA. This is a very basic example uh, in MAC authentication, which is the ARP to apply. Okay, uh, is the MAC authentication result okay or not? If it is not okay, I will have to apply in any case uh, an ARP because when, when you do MAC authentication, you have to become aware that there is no way to wipe out users, even if the authentication by MAC it fails because a MAC authentication means that you are already in the AP. You have, you have been associated and you have been, let's say, um, authenticated in, in, the, in the mean that there is no pre-share key or if, if it's a pre-share key, it, it is valid. So you are in the, in, the, in the AP. So you already have connection, you already have everything. So you did the authentication, uh, MAC authentication, even if it fails, there is no, we, we can wipe out the, the user, but it's not recommended because we want to do more things with the user, probably with Cathy Portal. But there's no way to, to wipe out the user, to, to reject the user. It is inside. Once it is inside, the, the, our recommendation is that you, de, you define a default access row profile that is uh, placing this user in a nowhere container, in a nowhere VLAN. For instance, uh, let's use VLAN 200 or 100, any VLAN that is not configured in the LAN side. So every packet that is moving away from the AP to the switching part will be discarded and this traffic will be never reached any, any, any place. So this user is here in the four dimensional place that you have no, no place to go. If the authentication is okay, okay, the user is valid, uh, then we could receive additional information with the ARP or not. If I don't receive this additional information with the ARP, then I will apply the default ARP again because I have no information. I can't do anything else. So apply the default one. If I get the ARP, then I will apply this ARP. So how we do this with regular guest access? This is how guest access works at the end. When one guest access goes into a hotel, the authentication will, will fail. As it fails, it will be here. And this, if this uh, radius response and this radius response, both of them are radius assets asset. Because, and, it, and this is something for, for radius, there is no way to exchange radius parameters uh, other than using an, an, an access accept uh, packet. If you do a reject, uh, there is no way you can exchange information. And you need to send information because the URL of the CATI portal is in this packet. So the AP will get this information and will learn that for this access row profile, the, the, that is the, the guest access entering, a new guest access entering into the network, which is this access row profile, I know the URL. I know I, I know they have to capture of the HTTP traffic and deliver it to this URL to this CATI portal. That's the reason that this, this one and this one will be always an asset for, for this kind of, of situations. And once, once the, the, uh, the, the, the CATI portal uh, is fully authenticated and everything is, is correct, then the, the CATI portal will send the UPAN in our case, or, or if it is an external CATI portal, the CATI portal or the UPAN, as I told you, will send and reduce chain of authorization with the new ARP that could be this one. Okay, so this is the how it works in the in the MAC authentication framework. Uh, again, for uh, this is a more, much more complex situation where you have uh, a, a real one X authentication with external database. Uh, many many things to do here. I will not go into the details. Uh, just follow the the tree. The, the decision tree is very simple. Just take care of this one is this one because I ran out of space here in this, in this slide and I have to go into this, uh, I move it here. So uh, that's the only thing you, you should take about. Okay, so for, for the, uh, how to keep coherence in, the, in your network, we, we need to do it in um, combination with the omni switches. So what we do is to uh, exchange exactly the same information that is living here is the same that is here. So the ARP can be 
sent to the access road profile, to the, sorry, to the AP, to the standard AP, to the OmniSuite. It's exactly the same context, exactly the same information. Everything is the same. So we exchange this information, and what we do here is the in the AP, you don't have to touch anything. Because, for instance, the tagging that we have to do with the billing tag or the service tag uh, is automatically created once you apply the ARP. If you uh, more than apply when you need to use the ARP, when this guy is placing traffic here, dynamically the access road profile will be instantiated and then the traffic will tag it with this. With it. But you don't have to tag anything here. And you will see that you will not have to do anything here in this side as well. Because we will dynamically create that, that tag in the in, in our framework, and this change may change with uh, with change of authorization, with different uh, when the user is uh, exits and enters the network with a different profile or in a different SSID, whatever. So it will change, and you don't have to do anything. It will change dynamically. No, you don't have to worry about it. Here in the OmniSwitch part, what we do is to create a, a trust relationship between the the CRAP and the OmniSwitch. And once we have this, this relationship, the, all the magic flows. Uh, we, we can not do it with uh, uh, third-party uh, third APs. It only works with the stellar APs. We could make it work with third-party APs, but automatically, out of the box, it works only with stellar APs because there is an exchange of information in, using LLDP protocol that will uh, uh, have some information that may allow you to uh, allows the OmniSuite and the Stellar AP to develop or to agree on this trust uh, uh, relationship. And then that's all. Once I trust the AP, if I receive target traffic from the AP, then I will create automatically this traffic, uh, this this traffic for, for it. I will do everything automatically. I will keep the same context in W in, in WLAN and your LAN network. And this is uh, for today, more or less. Now we are entering in the in the lab space. Uh, let's go, let's go, let's go there. And here we have our omnivista. Sorry. Okay. And we were going to create some MAC authentication. So maybe I have already created. But I want to remove it. I don't want to. I want to start from scratch. So Mac out. I will delete it. Okay. And while it is deleted, I will delete as well the actual profile that I created. Okay. This one. Delete. Okay. Finish. And in the template, I will remove as well the Azure profile. Okay. Finish. Okay, so let's create a new a new SSID. Let's go to the SSIDs. And let's create a new one. Okay, for this example, I will, I will I'm going to create a new a new SSID which is called Mac Authentication that will do Mac Authentication. So I don't want to get too much complex. Let's say this is like you can select here is a wizard that will help you to the to in in the configuration. But let's keep it simple. It's a guest network with open information. Okay, open. I don't want to go to the captive portal. If we add the captive portal, we'll be a little more slower and we are running out of time. So let's create and customize. So SSID will be Mac out, perfect, it's open. Uh, I don't want uh, a portal, I will it ban all of them, and I want to do Mac authentication, okay? Mac, Mac authentication enable, and I want to use the radio server, which is the UBAN, okay? Perfect, the UBAN radio server, nice, cool. And as I selected the UBAN radio server, the, the, the wizard will populate for me the, the UBAN rules. Remember the UBAN has access policies, Try to match the information that is coming from the radius. It will create this this ones. This access policy is the one that is going to be automatically created. And in this case, the matching condition is that the SSID is equals to MAC out. So every time I receive a radius request with the SSID MAC out, 
will enter into this access policy. Very simple, right? And then if that match, we will execute the authentication strategy MAC authentication. The authentication strategy is where we are going to tell the UPA what to do with this authentication. We will, we will see that in, in some minutes. So perfect, automatically populated the, the UPAN rules, nice. And then we have the access role, the access role attributes. This is just the default access role profile that I'm forced to create. Okay, so I'm going to eliminate this villain because this is, this is not the, the one I want to use. I want to show I want to show you the different things that, that you can use in the in the access role profile. In the access profile, you will have the villain, in this case, or is, is it that? In this case, we will be using, for instance, 200, because I want this, uh, this ARP to block traffic. So I'm going to use 200, because 200 is a billion that I know that is going to nowhere in, the, in my switching network. So I don't want this information to go anywhere, because it means that the authentication failed. If the authentication failed, I don't want this user to go anywhere. So I'm blocking this uh, in, in the using billion 200. I could do exactly the same using a QoS or an ACL. So if you want to do ACLs or QoS, just select new. That will give you to the wizard for creating uh, ACLs of QoS policies, and then you will add it here. So you are extending your access row profile with as much complexity as you want. Here, we'll be replacing again <clears throat> as well the uh, layer seven rules, the layer seven application recognition rules. You can do one of gardens, location policies, you can create, okay, if this guy is in the lab, but this lady is in the main office, they have different roles, okay? You can do here, uh, period period policies, uh, is the working hours or weekends or all these kind of things. You can do bandwidth control, you, okay, if uh, I don't want them to go up uh, over 200 uh, megabit per, per second or 100 megabit per second or whatever. This is something you can do here. The, the regular bandwidth and the burst. So you can control not only the average bandwidth, but you can control the burst uh, traffic that is allowed. You can do logging uh, of, the, of the client's behavior, so you can control what are your users doing in your network. Okay, it's very, very important as well sometimes. And for hotspots and service providers and so on, the DHCP option 82 is mandatory if you want to play in that space. So this is all the things you can do in the in the in the ARP. I am not all, I'm not using all of them. I mean this in the the villain the villain part and I'm going to save and apply to AP group. Uh, by default they're using the default AP group. I want to change that. So default I will add the Ali home lab which is the as for this COVID-19 we have the the home uh, uh, home lab and apply. And now all the APs that belongs to this API group, which is the Ali Home Lab, are receiving this configuration. They already have this configuration. This is the MAC authentication, the radio server, and this is the MAC out uh, server and so on. And here you can see the access row profile. This is the access row profile that's going to be used. It is automatically generated, the name, which is underscore, underscore, MAC out. So this is the default access row profile. Okay, so if something fails, that will happen. But what is happening in the UPAN side? Let's go to the UPAN. Remember the UPAN was populated in this MAC out. And this MAC out says that mapping condition is the SSID equals MAC authentication. You have to execute the authentication strategy MAC out. Okay, MAC out. Let's go to the authentication strategies. Here we have the MAC out. Let's edit. And in this case, to keep it simple again, we will use our local database. So we have to keep our users, and here we can assign a different profile. Okay, uh, but remember, I have to populate first the AP with the with the profile. How can I do it? Very simple. Let's go to Unified Access. Let's go to the template, and these are all the access row profiles that I have in OmniVista. Okay, the, these access row profiles are in OmniVista. Are some of them may be in some, uh, in some APs, some of them may be in others, some of them may be in all of them, it depends. So this is a template, okay? So it's not what is really in our APs. We will see later what is in our APs. 
So I'm going to create a new one. I will call it uh, Mac Authentication OK, which seems to be fair in this case. Uh, I have the same set of information. I can, I can add a policy list. I can add a, a location list, a location policy, sorry, uh, a period policy, interval uh, inactivity. If it is 10 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever, then it will, I will close the session. This is important, especially in this uh, wireless service provider where the activity interval is important. Uh, bandwidth contracts, uh, client session login, wallet garden, captive portal attributes, and the DHCP option number 82, which is uh, mandatory. I will not use anything of that, okay? Just the name and we'll create. So this container is empty because I don't want to use all of this, but for you to understand, this is an accelerator profile. This is a container, this is a, a set of policies. And I want, I need to apply this information because now it is living in the Vista, but it's not in the AP. So I want to apply it to the APs. So I select it, it can be select uh, all of them if I want, in this case only this one, and apply to devices. I want to apply to devices. And this is another part of the magic because I can link this ARP with VLANs, with SPV services, with BXLAN services, with static services, with a tunnel, like to GRE tunnel for ending the GRE tunnel in, a, in an Omni switch or for ending a GRE tunnel in an in a OEM controller. I can do many things. In this case, again, keep it simple for the demonstration. It's a VLAN. I don't want to use VLAN 1. In this case, I want the VLAN to work and I have to link it with VLAN 1 if I want it to work. So it's VLAN 1. And then I select the, uh, remember that I use the 200 in the default one because I don't want it to work. I, I want to keep them in an isolated place. In this case, I want to move it, move them to the real network, uh, which is the, the VLAN one. Let's assign it to the Ali Home Lab and apply. Okay, done. Then the APs already have it. Perfect. Now I can go to the UBAM authentication strategy. And here in the default Axel row profile, I can place it here, Mac authentication, okay. Okay, that's all, apply. Perfect. Okay, let's see what's happened. Now I'm going to go to my laptop and see, okay, Mac, Mac authentication, it is open. There is no need for a preset key and I'm going to connect. So I'm going to connect, oh, sorry, that's all. I, I, there's something wrong here. I forgot to employee account. I have forgot to wipe out my. Okay. Okay. Sorry, sorry, guys. Let's connect. Connect. And go to the uh, UPAN authentication record. Okay, I have this guy here and it failed. Okay, it failed because my MAC address is not in the internal database. I have just removed it. Sorry, sorry. Uh, these things happen. And as it is it is not in the in the internal database, it fails. The authentication fails. And if the authentication, the authentication fails, the, uh, the there is no way to generate um, here it is. Okay, so let's see what happened. The, we, I should be applied with the default access row profile. Remember, the, I, I failed, so let's go to the client list. I will do, I'm going to select my, my laptop. Oops, it's not uh, still here. I don't know if I'm connected. Okay, it's connected. As I'm, I'm running the demo using the cable, all the traffic is going through the cable and sometimes uh, there is no traffic in the wireless LAN site. That's the reason it takes a little bit more to recognize. But here, here we are, this is my laptop at Darnassus. And Darnassus has received the ma underscore, underscore Mac authentication. So I am receiving the default, uh, the default as a robot file that is in the nowhere because this is my, if I do I show VLAN in the switch. Do you see that? 
sorry, excuse me, uh, 200 is is not is not is even is created dynamically created is not going to anywhere. So it is isolated. As it is isolated, the connection tell me that no internet because I didn't receive even IP address. Okay, so it works. We receive the default accelerator profile. What happens now if I populate with my with my MAC address the the UPAN internal database? Let's do it. Copy and let's go to the employee account. When when you do MAC authentication, you can do it with employee's account or company property. Employee account is easier to populate, so I prefer to use it. And here we have the username, which is my MAC address, and password again the same MAC address and repeat the password. Be aware that we have here access row profile again. So this is the third asset row profile. Remember the external source that could be an external radius, an external active directory, or the internal database. We will later on play with this uh, access row profile. Okay. So in this case, I, I just populate my my laptop, and I will disconnect and reconnect. And disconnect and connect. Let's go to the UPAN records. And now uh, it passed. As you see, now as the MAC address is in the internal database, it passed. And now I should receive a profile, a MAC authentication. OK. If I go now to the, maybe here we can refresh. Sorry. OK. And the final access row profile is the MAC out. Now, if I go to the wireless LAN clients, Client list. I go to my to my um, to my laptop again. As there is no traffic, uh, it takes a little bit to to refresh. Okay, this morning was uh, faster. Okay, I'm connected. Ah, okay, here we are, the Nasus, my laptop, and I go to the Azure profile, I have MAC authentication. Okay, so I am receiving the, the, the in this case, we are receiving the authentication strategy Azure profile. Okay, now let's go to the to the UPAN again and then go to the employee account and modify this, this guy here. I will modify it and add an Azure profile, let's say, for instance, Rivendell. That is in my in my AP. So now, if I disconnect and connect back again, it will trigger again the authentication process. It will go to the authentication process. The authentication process will be valid, and we will have an extra profile that is coming from the external source. In this case, the internal database with Rivendell. I have the extra profile. Remember in the authentication strategy that is MAC authentication OK. And then we have the default access profile. As I told you, if this is the case where all of them have information, the 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 the, the most uh, the top level preference is for the external source. So let's see what happened. Let's go to the authentication record. And here it, it passed, obviously, because it's the same MAC address. And now it is driven them because it takes the highest precedence. It is the higher priority. So if I go again to the client list and the hopefully, okay, I see here Darnassus and here it is Rivendell as being the profile that, that we are using. Okay, perfectly. It works nice. Uh, we are running out of time. What, what happens if I select um, uh, a, a profile that is not that, do, that do, does not exist in the in the AP. For instance, in this case, if I go to the AP, device config will show you the real configuration in an AP. Let's go to the sorry cancel in the access row profiles and okay home lab. I see that there is no IoT and there is one of the profile is IoT. If I go to the templates. Esto es lo que hay. Here we have 
IoT. Okay, I'm going to use this one, IoT, I will populate it because it's a valid as a row profile, but that's not been populated in the APs, in this, in this, in this APs, probably in other IP groups, but in this AP group it is not present. So I will go to the UPAN employee account. I will take this one and change from Rivaldell to IoT, which is let's say an invalid access row profile. Apply and then disconnect and connect again. Let's go to the authentication records. Sorry. And here we see that it passed. Okay, perfect. It says that the, I, that the profile to be applied is IoT, but it is taking it a bit longer because it's something that is not working here. So let's see if we refresh. And okay, clear. The, the, we received the IoT profile coming from the outside world, probably from the Edu Roam Reduce, for instance, an external Reduce in Edu Roam. We received an access row profile, but it's not a valid access row profile. So, which one I'm going to use? I will use the default access row profile. In this case, the default, remember, is SLA, uh, underscore, underscore, MAC authentication. And this is the one I am I, applying. If I go then to the client list and I go here to the, to the, to the my, laptop, I see that is underscore, underscore, Mac authentication. So this is like a sample of when something goes wrong, even you perfectly know what is going to happen, okay, it's, it's, which is nice. And last, I, I, I like to show you the integration between, between both parts, which is done using UMPs. UMP is the user network profile, remember, so configuration snapshot. Snapshot DA UMP UMP stands for user number profile, which is exactly the same as the uh, access number profile. As I told you, the same, exactly the same concept. So here we are, we are going to dynamically uh, exchange information and receive information from the stellar and generate and populate our our switches with with the, with the profiles and dynamically create the services. In this case, for instance, if I do a show UMP user, which is the dynamically created, I can see that I have the port 115 and 118, which is I saw it here. 115, it is, the, all of this is in the presentation. 115 is for VLANs and 118 is for uh, SPV. Okay, so I have the, the, both examples in the same switch. This is an 6865 switch, uh, so it's working both with VLANs and SPV. And as you can see here, I, I created dynamically the VLAN 200 that is going to nowhere, remember? And I created dynamically this, this association with the VLAN 1 for, these, for, this, for, my, for my laptop. My laptop received the, the 138. And this is the management VLAN in the, in the, LAN, in the LAN side. Remember the 115 is the, is the, is the, is the LAN part. And we see here, the 10 for me is the management villain. And the management villain in the SPV is 10 as well, but it's not a villain, obviously. It is mapped to a different service. So if I see show, um, so services, so services SPV, I will see here, this guy here is up because I dynamically created this service based on this villain 10. And that's all. Uh, thanks for your patience, for being a little bit late. I uh, really appreciate you being here and really want you to, uh, sorry guys, really want you to to see if there is some, some questions. I don't see any questions on our question panel. Your presentation was so th thorough. Okay. Does anyone have on the line have Maybe. anything they want to ask? Or maybe everyone's asleep. Wake up! No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 can only list so much technical um there's still quite a few people on the line but i don't see any questions unless someone wants to ask something or if you'd like me to unmute your line brian witt said thank you it's awesome um i am happy to uh and david perez very good thank you. you thank you Daniel. these guys are all puffing you up um <laughs> 
So if there are no other questions, we'll give everyone their time back. Uh, again, you'll get, thank you very much, Jorge, for presenting. Uh, right, as always, really, really appreciate your feedback. And uh, you'll get an email tomorrow from GoToWebinar with the recording embedded, and then contact me if you happen to miss getting the PowerPoint. Just reply to the email. So thank. Oh wait, here's a question: AAP TLS will be supported on UPAM without external radius. EAP TLS, in fact, is supported today without external radius. The 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 only thing we are missing that is coming in the next release, which is. 4.5 R2, as you know, is that we will enforce um, the, the, uh, the, the EAP TLS uh, allows you to, to exchange the data certificates both sides, allows you, but does not mandate. The, the, only, the, the only requirement is that the server, I mean the radio server or the network if you want, send his credentials. So his certificates to the to the end device to the user that is connecting, but the the, the protocol the, the protocol definition and the RFC does not mandate that the client sends the certificates and this and the and the network side checks this this certificate. That's the only thing we are missing today in our implementation of the EAP DLS. So what we are doing is exactly what the standard uh, says. So, but we are going to go. We want to go a little bit further. And we understand that if both parts are exchanging their certificates, what we want is that both parts check the certificate, which is means sounds logic. So that that's the thing we are coming. We are bringing now in 4.5 R2. So in 4.5 R2, we will not only be fully compliant with the EAP EAP TLS, but we will be able to enforce that the client certificate must be valid in order to connect to the network. That is the only thing we, we, we were missing. We, we were missing, again, uh, we are fully compliant with the with the standard. Today. Okay. Okay, hopefully that answered your question, Eduardo. Uh, anybody else on the line have anything? Does not look that way. So, thank you, Jorge. Eduardo, Eduardo, if you if you need some more information, please don't hesitate in contact me, and we can we can we can uh, share more information, and I can clarify any point. Great, thank you, thank you. Okay, I hope everyone has a great uh, rest of their day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne, and thank see you. you in the next in the next webinar. Stay yeah. tuned. Bye.